This is a rebroadcast of the Eau Claire City Council Work Session Meeting. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFPLP 
big funnel. Um, the city manager and I meet with uh, division and department heads to talk through uh, what their what their requests are. And those requests all kind of come out the bottom of the funnel, and uh, the city manager and I um, kind of filter those requests based upon really based upon two things. One of them are the city council priorities. Uh, and we talked about those a little bit at the work session. I'll, talk, I'll just run through them very briefly uh, this, evening as, uh, this evening as well. And also the city council's policies. And we've talked about those before. And uh, uh, within the last year and a half, the city council has adopted fund balance, uh, total debt and debt service policies. So uh, we take all of those projects, uh, we run them through those filters uh, to make sure that uh, what we're uh, proposing uh, meets the priorities of the city council and also complies with those policies. And uh, at the at the end, we come out with uh, what's before you this evening, which is the proposed CIP. Um, and uh, you know, this is intended as a plan, and uh, it is uh, also intended that there may be modifications along the way before it finally comes back to you for uh, uh, for your consideration. Uh, city Council priorities, um, we talked about this a little bit at the work session, uh, and Dale touched on it. Uh, resources should be provided for the maintenance of existing infrastructure and facilities and the timely replacement of equipment. Uh, resources should be provided for the continued growth of the community. And from our uh, work session, uh, we also talked about that resources should be provided to enhance the sense of place and community. So um, that was something we added Right, added to our list of priorities based upon the feedback from, uh, from council. Uh, so we're going to do, do this a little different uh, this year. Hopefully this is, uh, hopefully this is going to work. In addition to the uh, document that you, oh no! <laughs> Kelly! Sorry. I didn't that. Uh, Okay, this information is all be connected to the internet. I should be, it says I am. Okay. Taking a look at how projects are 
being funded, and again, this is for all funds within the capital program. Uh, by far and away, uh, the issuance of debt uh, is the primary way that we are funding projects in, the, in this particular CIP. Uh, about 41% of the projects are being funded by tax-supported debt, that is, debt that uh, is uh, issued and repaid uh, through um, the uh, property tax levy. And about 20% of the fund, uh, the uh, funding is being provided uh, by well, what's called self-supported debt. Self-supported debt is debt that's, uh, that we issue but is repaid through uh, some other form, of some other source of revenue other than property taxes. For example, um, the water utility, the sewer utility, uh, uh, tax incremental districts. They're repaid from other sources of revenue other than the uh, general property tax levy. So those two sources represent about 61% uh, of, the, uh, of the funding uh, in, the, uh, in this capital program. Uh, operating income is the next largest source of revenue. Operating income is uh, funds that come into uh, the utilities primarily, primarily from user fees. So we all pay a, a water bill and uh, the funds that the utility receives uh, through the payment of the water bill, um, or at least a portion of that is used to fund, uh, fund capital improvements. Uh, next largest source of funds uh, is uh, the general fund transfer, uh, and that represents, at least for 2017, about $2.7 million, or so 8% uh, of the proposed projects. So if you happen to open up this slide, uh, you can see there's a little slide bar here at the bottom. If I move that across, I can get the same type of view for 2018, for 2019, and all the different, all the different years uh, of, the, uh, of this proposed CIP. Looking just at the general fund funded projects, uh, almost 70% of the projects uh, that are, are funded by the general fund uh, are from uh, tax levy supported debt. Uh, again, far and away the primary uh, way that, these, uh, that we're able to fund uh, these particular projects. Uh, about, again, as I indicated before, about $2.7 million in 2017 will come from the general fund transfer and then uh, self-supported debt uh, comprises a much smaller share at about $1.6 million, and that's from uh, special assessments uh, that are, uh, it's self-supported because uh, it, the debt is repaid from the, uh, from the special assessments. If we look at uh, breakdown of funds by, uh, by funding sources, and again, this is for all funds in the CIP, uh, the general fund represents about 59% um, of all the, uh, all the funds in the uh, capital program. Uh, the water utility is going to be the next largest um, funding source at about $4.2 million. Uh, we've got economic development uh, at about $3.5 million. Uh, that includes, uh, uh, includes the uh, tax incremental districts uh, within, uh, within that. Uh, and uh, central equipment would be the next largest at about $2.1 million. Same thing, you, you know, if you want to take a look at different years, we've got the slide bar on the bottom uh, to do that as well if you want to um, break it down by, by funding sources. Um, and if we look at just the general fund projects, um, again, the majority of this capital program is being used for transportation improvements. Now, for this year, we've actually uh, lumped, um, uh, or using the terminology from last night, I guess, plumped um, the. Um, I'm going to regret <laughs> bridges, yeah. we, We've plumped bridges and streets together and into a single fund now called transportation improvements because there was a somewhat arbitrary distinction about where a, uh, where a street ends and where a bridge begins. So. And trails too. So we've we've put them into the, into a category of transportation improvements, and those represent about 55 percent of the general fund portion of the uh, of the cap proposed uh, capital program. Um, we've got uh, parks and recreation, which represents about 17 percent, getting at that uh, council priority of uh, of a sense of place uh, and, uh, and community, uh, land building and equipment. Uh, represents about 17% um, of the uh, CIP as well. 
Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the parking fund in 2017. Uh, we got about $1.2 million uh, in the um, uh, proposed CIP uh, for improvements uh, to parking facilities. Uh, just also point out that um, not only are we proposing improvements to the Gibson Street ramp uh, being funded by the parking fund, but we're also proposing improvements to the ramp being funded through uh, tax incremental district number 11. So when you, I think in total there's over uh, probably over three million dollars uh, in this capital program for uh, enhancements to the Gibson ramp uh, from those uh, from those two sources. So this is uh, the, the, the breakdown um, of uh, projects in the CI, uh, general fund projects in the CIP. Uh, if we look at 2018, um, similar, uh, similar breakdown, uh, transportation improvements actually represent about 63%. Uh, Hobbs Ice Center jumps up because uh, uh, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got about a million dollars in for Hobbs for the uh, Northern uh, Addition, a small addition to that uh, particular facility. Um, transportation, uh, public transit jumps up uh, at about $1.7 million uh, for, for bus replacements. 2019, again, transportation uh, improvements ends up uh, being the, the, the largest piece of uh, this particular, uh, particular pie. Parks and recreation is still up around 12% uh, um, of the proposed CIP. Um, and so I think you'll see that pattern continue uh, through all five years uh, of, the, uh, of the proposed uh, CIP. So what does this mean in terms of, uh, in terms of our, our, our debt and, and council's policies? Uh, this, this chart represents, the blue line uh, represents our our past debt service, and the red line represents our proposed debt service. Uh, we had a we have a significant dip in our debt service for 2016 because, if council recalls, we didn't issue any debt in 2015. We funded many projects with uh, with cash on hand as opposed to issuing debt. So that's that's why we have this 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 dip here. Um, but then uh, our debt service uh, does go back up. And then, and then basically runs parallel to that historical, uh, historical line. So if you take this dip out, which is somewhat of an anomaly, um, you know, more or less we're, we're running parallel to what the historic, uh, uh, the historic, our historic debt service has been. Um, this chart we've seen before, um, this is just updated for the 2017 through 2021 CIP. Um, the uh, bars represent um, our unassigned fund balance as a percent of the subsequent year's expenditures. Uh, the City Council's goal is to keep our fund balance between 15% and 20% um, of the subsequent year's expenditures. Um, any funds above 15% can be considered for use uh, for one-time projects such as funding uh, capital projects in the CIP. Uh, as you can see, um, if this, this bar here represents our projection for 2017, and throughout the five years of, this, of the proposed CIP, we would continue to be in compliance uh, with the City Council's uh, policy on, uh, on, on fund balance, and uh, would get down to about 16.8% uh, in uh, 2021. One of the City Council's other um, policies has to do with total debt. Um, as many of you remember, the uh, state statutes restrict uh, total debt to 5% of the equalized value of a, uh, of a community. Um, the City Council has a policy at 60% of that amount, which represents 3% of equalized value. So uh, under the proposed CIP, uh, this blue area, is where our uh, net general obligation debt would be. This anything below this green area represents um, would be in compliance with the council policy, and anything below the red area uh, would uh, be in compliance with the state limit, but out of compliance with the city council's policy. So the blue area is below the green, so uh, 
throughout the course of the CIP, that we would continue to be in compliance with that, with council policy on uh, total debt. Uh, similarly, uh, council has a policy that debt service should represent uh, less than 25% uh, of the tax levy, and uh, the green area, again, represents uh, what our, our debt service would be under the uh, under the proposed uh, capital uh, plan. The red area represents what 25% uh, of the tax levy is. So again, throughout uh, you know, since 2008 and projected out through 2020, uh, we would continue to be in compliance with the uh, uh, with this particular policy. Okay, can I interrupt you? Absolutely. Um, I just. It, on your, your graphs, everything is trending upwards. The fund balance is, is decreasing. The debt is increasing um, over the next four to five years. Is there anything driving that? Um, the driving, what's driving that is is the increased need for capital improvements. Um, our facilities are continuing to age um, and continue to need to be maintained. I think that um, for for some period of time. Uh, perhaps they, 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 the maintenance levels were not funded where they needed to be. And uh, we're really trying to play catch up right now. Um, I think a number of years ago, um, as I've been told, uh, there was a very conscious council decision to catch up um, on street maintenance. Um, and now we're playing catch up on building maintenance, very, very frankly. Um, and and we've got, uh, we got, we have a lot of work to do. No, no big project in particular or anything like that. I mean, we're series of it's it, it's really just really being driven by really being driven by maintenance. Now there are some fairly large projects in here as we get into it. Uh, there are some pretty major enhancements being proposed to uh, Carson Park to the Ball Diamond. There, uh, there is a, a pedestrian bridge over the Oakley River connecting um, uh, connecting the. Confluence project to Phoenix Phoenix Park. So there are some some fairly large projects in here that, that certainly are contributing uh, contributing to that as well. And we'll point those out. Yeah, so we'll point those out as we get to them. But I would really I I, I really characterize this as as uh, a continued emphasis on getting caught up on our maintenance. We've fallen behind on vehicle replacements. We've fallen behind on the maintenance of this building, um, and we need to. Uh, we need to get caught up on those things. So, uh, um, council, one of council's other uh, parameters within your debt policy is that debt should be less than three times our operating revenue. And uh, as you can see in this uh, particular chart, we're well below um, the red area, which represents uh, three times our operating revenue. So, the next steps. Um, we're, we're here today conducting our first work session, and um, we've got additional work sessions scheduled for June 2nd and June 6th, uh, June 6th if needed. Uh, following the City Council's work session, we'll make any, uh, any adjustments that there seems to be some consensus on, um, and the uh, proposed CIP will go on to the Transit Commission for their review on June 15th, the Plan Commission for their review on June 20th, uh, for the parks and waterways on June 22nd. As you can see, that's a, a very busy week right there as far as reviewing the CIP goes. And then uh, July 12th, it will come back to the City Council uh, for consideration and uh, action on the Capital Improvements Plan. And remember, at that point, this is still a plan. Um, we, that we won't ask the City Council to make any appropriations uh, until uh, until November, and those appropriations will be made as part of the budget process when we'll roll 2017 into the, uh, uh, any appropriations for 2017 uh, into, the, uh, into the operating budget as well. So those are really the next steps, and hopefully we get this done by July 12th, just in time for Charlie to go on maternity leave. So we've got this, we've got this schedule very tightly here, so we appreciate, you it. appreciate your cooperation. <laughs> So that's uh, that's the extent of my presentation. Um, you know, with that, uh, we can uh, go to uh, you know the go to.
the first uh, water utility. Jeff or Phil, you want to come up and join us at the uh, join us at the table? What are you looking for, Jay? Why don't you just give us a quick, quick summary of um, just like the budget plan? Quick summary of what's in here, and if uh, council members have any questions, uh, please. We've got uh, we've got Phil and Jeff here to uh, address any questions uh, concerning uh, the projects that they're proposing. And I know you all just received this document minutes ago, but uh, um, this is a, a, a good opportunity to do that. So you'll see on the, for the water utility, we, we, we are proposing uh, quite a bit of work uh, at, at the plant. Uh, coming up in 17, we got uh, some design and engineering work for the basin modifications. Again, that's part of our 2014 master plan that we did in our water uh, treatment and distribution system. Um, the pit as well, replacing uh, well number 10, that's something that came up in regards to a maintenance activity that we were doing on well 10. The DNR uh, thinks that we have some lead material in the uh, existing well. Again, not to alarm anybody, we treat for uh, uh, corrosion of our water so it wouldn't be an issue and we wouldn't see it out in the system. But, um, Knowing that it's a possibility that it's there, we're going to actually abandon, abandon that uh, well casing and actually do a pitless unit away from it. So we're not losing that well at all. Um, pressure reducing station on Prairie Circle, that's essentially a problem that we've had uh, within this, our distribution system with some high pressure. What this will do is take care of those pressure spikes in that area. So uh, that area which is south of the city off of uh, highway 53 down by gander mountain in the uh, uh, state highway patrol office area down there um, and then you'll see the recurring projects that we have that go all through every year again that's uh, as jay was talking about that's part of our maintenance of our system um, the not only the city of eau claire but the whole u.s has an issue with uh, aging infrastructure this is our way of taking care of that aging infrastructure on those recurring projects. Jeff, are those the 2017 <coughs> store of recurring projects? Yes. That's the amount of 2017. Yes. Do we have pipes that have led in our city that we're continuing to replace them? Not, no. not main line pipes. We have about 1,266 lead service lines in the city so that we have. So the service line goes from the road into the home. No. So, so we have a, the one down on Forest Street comes taste weird when I drink the water at the garden. Oh, uh, then the, uh, yeah, the manifold there. I always wonder if some of those have lead from 1800s, they have lead in the original. No, that, well, yeah, no, I, again, I'd have to check that service line, but. Uh, but going to people's houses, where they yeah, the, the service line from the main to the to the meter, um, um, we have about 1,266 of those that we have documentation on there. As we come across any of those lead service lines, if they leak, we replace them. Um, we, we, we cannot make property owners replace from the curb stop, which is the shut off at the property line, into the home. But we've been very effect, uh, effective in convincing property owners to replace those. So, and then with Flint, Michigan coming up, it, people are more and more aware of uh, the health effects of lead. <coughs> we do, uh, the, the other thing is that we do lead and copper testing every three years. And that's a mandated test by the EPA, uh, handled by the Wisconsin Department of Police. So, and we have not had any issues with that. Again, we treat for that, so um, we treat for that corrosive water. But the treatment of that 
from the wells, or is it actually what's ending up in people's homes? It's it's the treatment that happens at the water treatment plant, and then the water goes to the so testing. Though is that on the that's in homes? Yes. Yeah, there's a, a chemical that goes in at the treatment plant that prevents the any lead and copper in the lines from leaching out into the into the water. It's a it's a preventive measure, something that they weren't doing. Right. This is really off the subject that Phil when when we when they reconstruct a street, uh, if there if there are lead pipes into any of those homes, is is it at that point that we ask people do you want to replace them? Yes, yes. And, and it's and it's also much cheaper as long as you already have the roid tore up right in front of you. It's discovered that there's lead in your in your service pipe. What would you say? Ninety nine percent of homeowners are gonna say yeah, so I could be confident that I would have known, I would know now if I had a red pipe since my road was done last summer. Somebody would have checked on that. Yeah, Dave, I think the, the fair answer there is yeah, without specifically checking Kathy Mitchell's. Well, no, but I, I, I should have been able to that. I mean, that's what you do. Uh, we, we've gotten a list for this year afterwards, some uh, Jeff's supervisors. I didn't recall. Getting less that I'm off the water, folks. Uh, for previous the previous history before I joined the city. But you're doing it now. Yeah, we have we have this now, and, and uh, they provide it to us when we have projects and clear your what segments we're doing. Can citizens check if they're on that list? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> we get those contacts all the time. Oh, under the service order, especially with people buying. In. <clears throat> we, can, we can certainly let people know that too, whether they ask for it or not. Yeah. It's becoming courtesy just because it's such a, a hot time issue with flooding. Some communities are actually putting it on their city website that you could go to and see if your home is on that list. But I'd, I would caution that we want to really make sure that. Uh, you know, there, there's an inspection process to, to make sure on the on the home site that it's it's accurate that it would be a lead service line versus something that we would want to want to alarm too many people in the There's probably more lead in the fixtures on the service. Yeah, that's the thing a lot of people don't realize is that until <laughs> when was lead lead solder uh, banned, Jeff? Uh, 1984. Until uh, 1984. Lead was often used in the solder, so even if you have copper pipes, um, there may be lead in the solder joints. And unfortunately, from January 1984 to September 1984, they realized that the highest concentration of lead was put in that solder before they abandoned it. They made the ban us. So, in regards to the rest of the CIP, you'll see that. Uh, um, um, you'll see the in 1819 we'll be doing the basin modifications again that's part of the uh, uh, process where we are going to take the manganese out of the water before it gets into the filters which will uh, allow our filters to operate more efficiently um, the raw water metering uh, in 1819 again uh, in 18, that's design engineering. And then 19 will be actually the construction, uh, updating our metering system throughout the, the uh, uh, well field and also the updating of the SCADA. And you'll see uh, in 19, we have some reservoir painting. Uh, basically our coats that are painting coats that we put on our reservoirs, they last 15 to 20 years. Uh, both these are uh, Damon and Oakwood are nearing that uh, that age right now. Again, it's very important. Uh, I, one thing I notice when I go to other communities, I notice their water towers and their fire hydrants because that's one thing I can tell is that they're keeping up their system. So um, we want to make sure that you know it's a it's a valuable piece of our infrastructure. If we don't maintain those uh, coats, they'll start uh, corroding and cost to maintain them after that would be much more costly. Um, 
you'll see in 19 we have uh, costs for um, a generator um, and also uh, updating our fiber optic and electrical in our well field. Um, the generator is, uh, we don't have an emergency generator at our water plant, so if we lose power, uh, we can't pump water. With the exception of a couple of uh, mobile generators we can bring out, we'll, we'll have the capacity to pump about 4 million gallons per day. Uh, we, on average, in the city of Eau Claire, we pump 9 million gallons a day, so we're, that is you know, significantly less than what we need to operate the city. The generator will actually give us the ability to uh, pump 9 million gallons per day and operate the, the critical uh, infrastructure and processes. That we Are you here in 1980? Did, did the system lose power during the July 1981 or so? Um, I was not, uh, I was still in high school, uh, but I was, <laughs> 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 was here. But what I can say is at that point and until a little while ago, we used to have two separate substations that fed the water plant. You could go back and forth, so you would have had to lose substations both from the east and the west in order for that to happen. We're now down, you know, we switched over to one substation. Yeah, one substation. So that's also part of the, we had some redundancy that we've lost, and this brings some of redundancy back. Combined heat power. Combined heat power. Yeah. For this general. And then you'll see in the 20 and 21, we put in a Chippewa River crossing. That's uh, currently we, our Chippewa River crossing that we have now was built in the 1930s, 1933 to be exact. And we've actually had a couple of breaks on that line that we've had to do a repair with water. You know, uh, it's a very complicated task when you have to be able to uh, get into that so they try islands and then they dewater the river out of it and we were able to do the repair on that. So this will actually create a redundant crossing. But again, if we have problems with the other, we, we still have the ability to supply uh, the water to the west side. And that was recommended in the, in the master plan. Can we remember that? <coughs> Questions for Jeff on water utility? Mm -hmm. What does sewer utility? As you can see with the sewer utility, we're not uh, spending as much uh, seeing that our $40 million <coughs> project is nearing our close, and I just should mention that uh, we do plan on an open house once the uh, final uh, restorations are completed, some of the grass starts growing, and uh, some of the uh, final uh, functionalist items are completed. So uh, my guess is that uh, we'll fill and we'll get back to Dale and let you know if he's, I'm hoping sometime in June, and hopefully we can find a day that works for everybody, that they can come down and see the new facility run. But uh, Dave, to your question um, earlier, the, the plant used to have 12 um, kind of labor employees. It's down to eight, so that's what the automation was. And so we still have staffing, certainly during the day, Monday through Friday, and also occasionally over the weekend. So we're scaling. It's no longer a 24-hour operation, but there are still people that are there doing the maintenance, um, adjusting air flows and, and things like that, as well as an active lab that is testing you know, the, um, the, the water on a very daily basis. And yeah, lab tests seven days a week, so we have some in the pumps and every, every day that we have the test, and that doesn't end. Um, that's a requirement under our, our permit. So as far as what you, you see with uh, the biggest part of the, the next Five years will be the citywide main replacement and extensions. Uh, um, again, that's the aging infrastructure. You know, we still have some sewer pipes in the ground that date back into the 1800s, and um, it's amazing how well they, they look and they, they're preserved in that clay tile. But um, there's a need for the replacement at that point. Um, and the rest of it, you know, we've got. Uh, 
we've got 24 lift stations in the city of Eau Claire, so that's that's another uh, maintenance item that we have to keep up on. You see the Eau Claire lift station improvements for $90,000 in 17. And as we move out, we, we, we have to look at our mall drive lift station replacement. Uh, that's that lift station was actually put in when the uh, London Square Mall was developed in that area, and it was actually the uh, put in by the, the old town of Washington Sanitary District. Um, that area has grown up significantly and that lift station is undersized for uh, for the uh, for what the capacity is coming into there. So that, that's going to have to be replaced in 18. Um, the Black Avenue lift station improvements, basically what that is is uh, uh, adding a on-site generator, that's one of our highest uh, flow lift stations now, um, with the exception of the Otter Creek and the Eau Claire pump station. This is one of our highest flow ones, so we're looking at uh, putting an on-site generator there. So if we lose power in that area, um, it will automatically pump. It's also, we have a fleet of mobile generators, and so when we do lose power, we, we drag these mobile generators around the city and we come up, you know, so it's keep this so we can lift it up and into the name so it stays out of the business. And we've got it, we've got everything timed now so we know how long it typically takes a lift station to fill up. So we, we know there are certain lift stations we don't have to be there for right away, but there are some that we do need to be there right away so we can time it up. Um, camera replacements, that's uh, part of the request from IS that uh, our camera replacements uh, that we've put in that they should be updated uh, uh, at times and so there's a place I we may end up pushing that back a little bit. Um, then you'll see in 819 we have an uh, atomic absorption spectrometer. Uh, the one that we currently have, uh, an AA just to give you an example, we were required to test for a lot of parameters and uh, the A test for heavy metals and we have to look at in, in our uh, biosolids that we get into the plant we have to test for metals because we land apply those uh, biosolids. We have to make sure that what we're putting on the, the ground isn't, uh, isn't outside of parameters set by the Department of Natural Resources. And then you'll see in 20 20, um, the Marston Street lift station replacement. Again, that's one of our, one of our older uh, lift stations in the city, and we'll be looking at replacing that station at that time. If you ever get a chance, maybe with a tour at some point, you'd be impressed at some of these lift stations. They don't look like much. I mean, it's just a little tube coming out of the ground, but underneath the ground is a tremendous amount of uh, infrastructure that is out of sight from and you can move away else. Is that Marston Street one? Is that right on the trip over here? That's right there by off of Thorpe Drive. Right off Thorpe. 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 That's why I mentioned right. it's one of those ones that just looks like it's nothing, but there's a lot of infrastructure down there. Yeah. One that we just put in on Otter Creek last year. I think it was last year. Before. Off of House Road there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how often do you are people visiting these? We visit them every Monday. So every Monday we go to each station, we check them out, and we, we there are several of them. If you recall, we did a story with uh, uh, TV 13 or a Lunar Telegram regarding some of the rakes we get at some of our list stations, some of the uh, disposable uh, cloths, cloth and wipes. wipes. So we, we have to get there because those will actually plug our pumps up. And so we're there each Monday. That's one of our maintenance activities we do at our facilities that I would, we have something to go there. I see them there weekly. I was just wondering why. Yeah. It's usually a Monday. I, I guess I never paid that much okay. attention. Must be one Monday. <laughs> <laughs> There's also security and alarms in each of these that are um, linked back to the the main plant on Ferry Street, so that if, if the plant is tampered with or entered into, we know the alarms. Well, one of those 
a block up the street. I never noticed it. I never noticed anybody visiting that thing, except on rare occasions. And now that it's on House Road, it, uh, I see it all the time. Well, we should have been the, the, the one you I'm sure you were. Gables Park. It was that Wednesday afternoon. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Questions on sewer utility? We found the stormwater. <clears throat> well, you'll see in the stormwater, um, basically, um, most of this will be regarding this, again, maintenance stormwater, uh, the citywide stormwater. During our projects, we have to replace stormwater on many of our projects. So you'll see that's a recurring project along with some detention based on acquisition and development. Again, uh, a way that we purify the water is that water runs through a detention basin before it runs out into a receiving water. Very important to make sure that we meet our limits for our stormwater permit. And Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about Jeffers and Halsey? Yeah, the Halsey Street Relief Storm Sewer. We've been increasing our storm sewer capacity in Putnam Heights, and there is a low spot on Hamilton that currently by Peace Lutheran um, Church. And we also have a large diameter storm sewer coming up State Street, and this Halsey Street would connect that low spot to our uh, additional capacity going down State Street along Halsey um, Street. And then that would help alleviate some of the flooding that we have. There's a vacant lot on Hamilton currently that we own that flooded in the past. And this would provide that connection. The storm sewer was constructed in that area in the 1950s and it was constructed prior to the rest of the development of that part of the Putnam Heights. So that is, it's not an acute flooding problem, but it's one that we need to take care of. So that's in 2018. And then 2019 and 2020 as a um, legacy project, um, basically connecting the storm sewer up on top of Jeffers Road in, in the vicinity of the development um, that is occurring with the condos and there's some townhouses out by the ballpark with an outfall that would be down um, discharging the Dells Pond. Yeah. And that's been continued. That's a legacy project also that keeps um, being reprioritized as necessary. Questions on stormwater. The stormwater utility also is in the process of completing the master plan. We have an ongoing, uh, another uh, project that was in the books with the, uh, the comprehensive stormwater plan update. It's looking at a number of uh, issues from ordinances that need to be uh, put on the books for the city, and we're planning an open house for uh, developers, businesses, consultants, and uh, it'll be publicly noticed. So, if council members would like to attend that in June. And then it largely we'll be putting into a formal ordinance our current practices that we go through when we do site plan review and other um, stormwater reviews with the plans, and putting it into one spot in the ordinance so it's very easily uh, identifiable instead of coming from different parts of our ordinances, as well as updating our guide to development that was last updated, I believe, in 1990 or 2000. Um, with the requirements. So if we have a new developer coming into town, we can hand them this book and, and you know exactly what the requirements are for our suspended solids reductions and our rate control for our discharge. Or that it has some, um, it's looking at the water quality happening in the lake, doing the water quality study for that um, basin. Um, as well as coming up with, we have a number of corrugated metal pipes in our storm sewer system. That, um, Typically our base material is concrete for the longevity and durability. However, we do have some CMP pipes, corrugated metal pipes, and it's coming up with a CIP program and rating the risk of a certain pipe in that system failing and its impact on traffic. So we can start identifying these CMPs and replacing them with concrete pipes. That should be wrapping up this year. <coughs> Parking improvements. Come on up to the table. <laughs> Join us. Anybody sick of parking yet? We won't bite. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'll go really quick for for these. Largely the improvements here um, are 
are on the recommendation from the working study that was completed last year. Uh, we are, as we examine some of those recommendations that were made last year, um, that were made at a rather high level, we found the deterioration was worse than you would um, than was witnessed at the level that the parking study examined. So we have a number of requests, like I mentioned earlier, for 2017 for the Fargo Gibson ramp that not only is covered with the um, Fund 406 here, but also with some uh, tax increment financing funding. But we're, we're requesting money uh, for the Gibson Street ramp of 1.6 million to change for 2017. That has concrete repairs, waterproofing, uh, LED lighting, uh, electrical upgrades, Painting the ceilings, as long as we're replacing the lighting, we're going to be um, painting the ceilings in that, so it will be a brighter um, ceiling. An additional pay station, currently there are two exits that come down, one is a contract park, or one is a pay station where you can pay. We're requesting uh, funds for an additional pay station where the contract only station is, so we could have two people paying an exit uh, as opposed to one. Uh, that would help for the uh, moderately busy, Event releases, um, if we had a true event where there was a play with a thousand people that ended at 9 o'clock, I still think that we would have to have an event where we would raise the arms and just let people out. Um, these, we have skin facade repairs on the elevator shaft. Uh, you may know the Lismore Hotel, the brick facade had to be replaced. Uh, we're anticipating having the same uh, issue with our elevator tower with those bricks. So we have a $150,000 request for that. It's being evaluated currently as we speak. And then we have a small uh, amount of ninety thousand for engineering contingency design for that. As we go forward into 2019, uh, for the Farwell Gibson Street ramp, we have another 450000 of repairs that were estimated. And again, these numbers will change most likely after our in-depth evaluation uh, that is currently going uh, ongoing with a structural engineer. Uh, but we have re repairs requested in 2019 for concrete repairs. Again, that's the, the decking that drive on, steel uh, corrodes with salt. So that's removing the loose concrete and replacing it with uh, new concrete. Waterproofing, some electrical work. And then in 2021, which is out there, we have 200,000 of uh, repairs for that. that are requested with concrete repairs again, waterproofing and electrical upgrades. Um, the Riverside parking deck is a lot smaller ramp. So for next year, we have a smaller list of requests uh, with concrete repairs, waterproofing, electrical. That's largely what we do with the ramps outside of it. If there's a, a large structural repair, it's just fix concrete as it becomes uh, delaminated or small. Um, continually monitor the electrical system and make repairs on a recurrent basis so we don't have to repair and replace the whole system like we're phasing across the street. Um, and then also, um, if there's waterproofing of seals in the ramp, we, we try to correct those seals, whether they're epoxy or they're rubberized for them. Um, and we have a list of repairs again on the Riverside parking deck in 2019 and 2021. Depending upon the um, if these numbers change significantly, uh, will affect, as well as the usage downtown, some of the other nice <coughs> features that we talked about earlier today with uh, additional revenue collection software, different ways to get signing. Uh, we can make a number of signs with uh, Steve Thompson's folks who are great at making static signs. Uh, so we, have, we have a small wayfinding budget uh, that we can use for some static signs in the parking. But as far as like, some of the changeable message signs with the LED, we can change um, I'd like to at some point get to the point where we have our parking lots where if you come down at 4 in the afternoon and the Schley and those shots, that's contract parking. If you come down at 6 o'clock, free public parking. So people driving through town that aren't familiar will see the International P sign and then also have the reinforcing message uh, that will help them get into those uh, parking spots. So we do not have a budget request for those yet. We're um, getting costs on those largely how aggressive we are with those requests that depend upon the modifications with um, the structural repairs that are necessary. One of the things that we're doing right now is we're having an analysis, structural analysis done of the parking ramp across the street because it's it's 40 years old. It was built to last.
past 50. So we're going to have, we have some immediate repairs that need to be done or we're not going to make it through the next 10 years, but there needs to be a discussion in the near future as to what's the plan for replacing that, uh, trying to extend the life of it, rebuilding it, whatever. So that, just when you thought you were done with parking ramps, there's that, that ultimately is the large question on it. Do we have 25 years sitting across the street or do we have 10? And that will affect some of these numbers also. How much we want to sink into it? How much we exactly. want to sink into it when we started? Are, are we interested in you know, sprucing it up or not? Um, it, it will depend on quite so. What you're seeing here are maintenance issues just to keep it for sure for that 10 years. But um, once we get this report back, it's going to give a a little better perspective if we really have five, we have 10, we have another 20, and then we can enter the discussion about where we go longer term, its facade, and that's much better. Um, um, one thing on the reoccurring, and we have DC security cameras and stuff, I, I think the new ramp has those, and I, I know that people have expressed a little bit of a safety concern there. Some people are going to wonder if that's part of this. The, the new ramp, we're funding the cameras out of the construction budget for the ramp, but oftentimes um, our IS folks fund ramps out of their equipment fund, or uh, not ramps, but cameras out of that. And if we have, if we don't use um, in recurring maintenance for um, ramp, and we have savings that we could propose it, we have, I think, three cameras in the ramp over here now. We're having 38 in the new parking ramp, so there is. So is, it, is it planned to put cameras in that ramp? I don't know when it's going to be funded, but is it, is it a plan to put cameras in that ramp? It's, it's a plan to improve that, the number of cameras, whether there's 30, 50, or more. Um, I don't think we have a plan to that level, and it's not specifically built now, at least in 2017. Um, I think that becomes part of the question with that, with the structural analysis study. If, there's, if, the, if the ramp really has five years or 10 years more of a lifespan, it may not be worth investing in cameras, but if it's, if it's 25 more years of life in that structure. Part, part of putting those cameras in is wiring them together. It's not just the electrical, but you know, you've got it done put fiber through the whole thing too. You know. but, but that's part of the plan here to rewire and, and do all that. So I guess I would, I would like to see it you know, all planned at the same time. And if it's well, structurally sound, it will have to go forward with this whole thing. If it doesn't, it don't, but it's not. It's not. And I believe there's one or two million set aside for the ring. Well, in the tip. Yeah. Up, 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 on the, up on the screen right now is, uh, is the, what's included in the Capital Program for the Gibson Street ramp. So um, in in 2017, we've got 1.2 million in the parking fund and 444,000. Uh, out of uh, TID number 11. 2018, we've got 250,000 from TID 11. Uh, 2019, 250 from TID 11, and another 452, so another 600,000. And uh, 19, another 250 and 20, and then uh, another five, close to $500,000 in 2021. So uh, in, in total, there's in excess of uh, three and a half to $4 million in the CIP for, for improvements to the Gibson Street ramp. So there are there are substantial dollars included in the CIP to continue to uh, maintain that facility uh, and, and, and spruce it up. But one thing about cameras, um, just so, so folks understand, is that uh, you know, the cameras are, are good for being able to, uh, if something happens, to be able to determine who, who may have done it, but as far as I know, those cameras are not actively monitored. So there isn't somebody sitting there at, you know, looking at all 38 screens um, to, to make sure nothing happens. Um, so, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it's good for determining what might have happened in the past, but uh, um, I don't think there's active monitoring going on. So I think just, just to we understand the desire to improve the cameras. We want to work towards that. Um, the money is here. We're still waiting for the analysis to tell us exactly the status of this wiring, what we need to do, where we have to go. 
and to the extent we can, we will add cameras. Whether it will be at the same level, you know, as the new ramp, probably not. But what we will be adding more security. It's not cameras, it's security, I okay. guess. And there's that option, like with the new ramp, one, we have proximity sensors in there. In there. We're not anywhere near that level with this ramp for design and what's going to be included. But the lights over there will dim at night. And then as somebody goes through there, it's kind of going to the refrigerator section at Walmart, the lights will turn on. So that helps for, for crime prevention. Let, let you know somebody's going on in there if there is a, a call that's coming in. Um, cameras, a static camera in the new ramp is 2,000 for a static camera, 5,000 for a pan tilt zoom. And the majority of the cameras are, are static. So it's not a terribly large dollar amount that we're talking about to add cameras in the grand scheme of the structural repairs. And that. What's the infrastructure? I mean, it might help us catch the skateboarders as well. On this one, uh, people that have skateboarders coming down very fast at them. But we're, we're really hoping that the parking site that ran across the street, just the increased usage, will help deter some of the crime that we're going to do. Do you have a payment uh, a pay station yeah. that's not manned? That is I think I remember going through a Madison and you just stick your card in and pay that way. No, bars are not banned currently. So then why would you open the gate after after hours? It the gate is down until you pay either putting your card in. And if you have an event, we would just keep the gate up. But what why that? Because you can't pay for it. So you before you pay the gate Yes. The question is you pay going in or you pay when you're going out. It's a lot bigger. Normally you pay when you go out. But for the event funding, you would prepay and we'll just open it up. You've got several hundred cars trying to get out at the same time from an event. That's when you want to do the pay on the way in so you don't have, have that. Yeah, I think we have reached our point at all. So a little check in. We are at 625. I don't, um, I always feel bad when staff comes and then we don't get to. Who's that? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Brown? Oh, yeah. So, um, Holly Translate will be up first. Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.